Hi everyone, it's Katrina. Number 7. Hunting for Thor's Hammer The Nazis were more obsessed with collecting bizarre ancient relics than many people realize. One of the worst offenders was Heinrich Himmler. He was a feverish racist, supremacist, and occult believer. Himmler even believed that to establish a new Aryan Empire, he needed to resurrect the old myths of Germania. Himmler and other top Nazi officials believed their war wasn't just against Europe, but against the lesser races. They also wanted to replace traditional Christian values with a new kind of mysticism. Even the symbol for the SS was made in the likeness of two runes created by Austrian occultist Guido von List. The SS, Hitler's group of elite operatives, was looked at as a kind of extension of the Order of Teutonic Knights, and they saw themselves as the modern Templars. Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler wanted to establish Wevelsberg Castle as the Nazis' modern Camelot for his most prestigious SS knights. Even though the Nazis weren't fond of Christianity, they were interested in holy Christian relics. Himmler was drawn to the legendary power of the Holy Grail, but there was another relic he desperately wanted to get his hands on because he believed it could win Germany the war. Himmler wanted to find Thor's hammer. Himmler's ideology was utterly insane. It was his true belief that the ancient Aryan race, which, by the way, isn't real, developed a powerful weapon of war. And that weapon went down in history as Thor's hammer. Himmler thought if they could just find the real hammer, they could smash the opposition in battle. But of course, Thor's hammer wasn't an ancient superweapon. And Himmler never found it. He also went in search of the Holy Grail, but that relic was never found either. And now for number 6. But first, it's shoutout time! I want to give a huge thank you to Demi and Chris for the super thanks and for supporting this channel. I'm so happy you've made OE part of your daily routine. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe for more videos like these. Number 6. The Spear of Destiny Another mighty weapon the Nazis wanted to get their hands on was the Spear of Destiny. Hitler learned about one of the greatest treasures of the Holy Roman Empire, the Hofburg Spear, and he wanted it for himself. This spear was said to be the weapon used by Roman legionary Longinus to stab Jesus Christ in his side at the crucifixion. The spear was supposedly carried by Emperor Constantine the Great, the brutal Frankish warlord Charles Martel, and many other conquerors and kings. The legend was that the Hofburg spear was endowed with magical power. Anyone who wielded it was almost guaranteed to win whatever battle they fought. The spear is a real artifact. It's a glorious work of steel and iron twisted with brass. At the end of the spear is an embedded nail. It was supposedly one of the nails that was used to hammer Christ to the cross. The spear was fitted with gold and silver in the 14th century, but nobody really knows exactly how old it is. However, the weapon is believed to date back to the Roman era. It was used by Emperor Otto I during the Slavic Wars of 955 AD. It even traveled to Antioch in 1098 AD, where it came under the ownership of the Knights Templar. When World War II broke out, the weapon was being kept in Austria, but the very moment the Nazis rolled into town, Hitler had it stolen and taken to a vault in Germany. Having claimed his mighty weapon, Hitler believed himself undefeatable, but as it turned out, the spear didn't help him much, and we all know how the war ended. Number 5. Aryan Jesus To help create a universal hatred for the Jewish people, the leaders of Nazi Germany sought to turn the tale of Jesus Christ into propaganda. An entire organization was founded specifically to invent an Aryan Jesus and write a Nazi Bible. The name of this organization was the Institute for the Study and Elimination of Jewish Influence on German Church Life. They existed from 1939 until the war ended in 1945. This was a vast conspiracy to change classic German Christians into hardcore Nazis. The Institute worked closely with the German Protestant church officials, and their goal was to find a clever way to turn Jesus into an anti-Semite. If they could convince the Christians to turn against the Jews, it would make the final solution a lot easier to complete. What Hitler wanted specifically was a theological excuse to eliminate all Jewish people. This is some very scary stuff. The Nazis came up with a new story for Jesus. He still had his ministry in Galilee, same as the normal Bible, but the Nazi version was populated by Assyrians, Iranians, and Indians. These people were forcibly converted to Judaism, 
and Jesus, in the Nazi version, was a follower of the ancient Hinduism practiced by real Aryans. Aryans came from Iran and settled in India centuries ago, and they were predominantly Hindus. Aryans were real people, but they came from Central Asia and Iran, not Germany. To make a long story short, the Nazi narrative was dramatically different from the standard Christian narrative. They took the Old Testament and revised it, just as it's been done so many times before. The Nazis removed Jewish names and places, and all references to Jews were now negative. Jesus was also depicted more as a military-style figure who fought against the Jews. The Institute was hoping that by manipulating the moral teachings of Christianity, they'd legitimize what they were doing with the Holocaust. The big hope was to get the German people on board and to spread the new evil ideas throughout Europe. Luckily, it didn't work, but it's a little scary how close they got. Number 4. The Hunt for the Grail Otto Rand was born in the Odenwald in 1904. This is a mountainous part of Germany renowned for its medieval legends. As a young boy, Otto was obsessed with stories of heroes. One of his favorite tales was the epic poem named Parzival, which tells the story of how the hero Percival went in search of the Holy Grail. For some reason, the story always stayed in the back of Otto's mind. When Otto studied philology at the University of Gießen, he learned of the exciting exploits of German archaeologist and adventurer Heinrich Schliemann. Schliemann had followed clues written in Homer's Iliad and discovered the ruins of Troy. Before Schliemann, most experts figured that Troy was a mythical city in a storybook, but it turned out to be fact, not fiction. So Otto began wondering if his favorite poem about the Holy Grail had some truth to it too. While at the university, Otto learned about the Cathars. They were a heretical religious sect in France during the 13th century. They were deemed so dangerous to the Catholic Church that the Vatican launched a crusade against them. Otto started to think that the Cathars had been the keepers of the Grail. So, he began dissecting ancient literature to find clues as to where the relic was hid. Then, in 1931, Otto Rahn went on his first expedition into the Pyrenees Mountains. He visited an ancient stronghold that had been the location of a siege in the year 1244. The Cathars desperately tried to hold out against the forces of the church, but they were defeated, and as a result, an estimated 200 Cathars were burned alive. Local legend has it that a small group of knights escaped the castle walls with the Holy Grail. Otto searched the ruins of the stronghold, but unfortunately, he never found what he was looking for. Otto published books about his bizarre ideas, which caught the attention of Heinrich Himmler. The leader of the SS then hired Otto to help him search for powerful ancient relics, including the Grail. Otto was given his own office and personal secretary. Part of his job was to uncover the truth behind ancient sagas. Remember how Himmler was searching for Thor's hammer? Otto was tasked with traveling to Iceland to study the Norse legends, hopefully finding out where the hammer might be hidden. Otto worked diligently to try and find both the Holy Grail and the hammer, but he failed on both counts. By 1939, Otto had yet to find anything conclusive. He was then given guard duty at the Buchenwald concentration camp, but he fled because what he saw there horrified him. Otto Rahn was then discovered weeks later, frozen to death in the Austrian Alps. Number 3. The Ghent Altarpiece the Ghent Altarpiece is an extremely valuable artwork called The Adoration of the Mystic Lamb. It was completed in 1432 by Jan van Eyck and his brother Hubert, who died before it was finished. When it was completed, the altarpiece consisted of 12 panels of various religious scenes. At the time, it was one of the most complex oil paintings in the world. So, it was installed at the St. Bavo Cathedral in Ghent, where it was supposed to stay until the end of time. But that's not really how it turned out. According to reports, it's been stolen, burned, and vandalized 13 separate times. All the panels have been recovered and restored after each incident, except for one, which still remains missing. The first incident took place back in 1566 when angry Protestants stormed the cathedral and tried to steal the altarpiece. They wanted to destroy it in a fire, but the guards had learned of their intentions and hid it beforehand. Pope Joseph II visited the cathedral and didn't like the nudity of Adam and Eve, so it was censored by the local mayor. Then, after the Napoleonic Wars, a French general stole the panels and put them in the Louvre. But the worst trial came in World War II. Hitler wanted the adoration of the mystic lamb for his art collection, and so too did German politician and military leader Hermann Göring. These crazy Nazis fell into a desperate battle to secure the artwork for themselves. Hitler got it first, 
but then Goring stole it from the dictator. Hitler eventually took it back, then had it stashed in a secret treasure vault in an abandoned salt mine. The Ghent altarpiece was finally discovered by the legendary Monuments Men after the war was over, but the lower left panel is still missing. It wasn't even the Nazis that took it. In 1934, thieves broke into the cathedral and took the single panel, and to this day, nobody's ever found it. Number 2. The Aryan Race Myth and Tibet the Nazis believed in the legendary city of Atlantis. They believed in a lot of weird things, but Atlantis was one of their more extreme beliefs. However, they didn't accept Plato's idea of Atlantis being a powerful island civilization that was destroyed by a vengeful sea god. In Hitler's fantasy, Atlantis was the ancestral realm of the Aryan race. In the 1930s, the Nazis and their occult friends started to wonder if the Atlanteans were still alive and kicking somewhere. They then pinpointed Tibet as the most likely candidate for the lost land of Atlantis. They figured there were still descendants of the original Atlanteans living deep in caves and in underground cities. In 1938, zoologist Ernst Schaefer led members of the mystical society known as the Ananerba on an expedition to the Himalayas. They'd be carrying out scientific work in the mountains, but their most important mission was to find proof of the Atlanteans. They searched high and low, but sadly, they couldn't find any trace of Atlantis. They interrogated locals, but nobody could give them any information as to where the Atlanteans were hiding. Not wanting to come away empty-handed, they came up with a new theory. How convenient. The German expedition decided there was a secret backdoor entrance to the hidden caves beneath Tibet and that it was somewhere in the Caucasus. According to history expert Igor Vasilyev, the Germans viewed the Caucasus as a much more accessible version of Tibet. It seemed equally mysterious, but far easier to explore. So, in 1942, an elite mountain division, along with members of the Ananerba, climbed Mount Elbrus in Russia and put the Nazi flag at the top. But why were they climbing mountains in the middle of a war? That's a question that historians continue to struggle with. In 2015, a company of troops was allegedly discovered buried by an avalanche. Nearby, mountaineers found a cave and a single brown carrying case. The case was from World War II and was emblazoned with the Ananerba insignia. It's believed Hitler's secret occultist climbed the mountain mountain as a cover so that they could try to find the secret entrance to Atlantis. But what really happened in those mountains is a mystery. Number 1. The World Ice Theory The Nazis weren't just searching for magical relics, they were looking for power from the cosmos. The propaganda minister of Nazi Germany, Joseph Goebbels, notoriously hired astrologers to produce material for him. Hans Bender was a parapsychologist whose bizarre cultic experiments were sponsored by the Third Reich, and both Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler were supporters of the World Ice Theory. If you haven't heard of the World Ice Theory before, get ready for some serious weirdness. The concept was initially proposed by inventor and engineer Hans Horbiger from Austria. He came up with the idea that ice is the core substance of everything in the universe. It was his thought that ice moons, ice planets, and the global ether determined the development of existence. The Austrian engineer didn't reach his conclusions based on any scientific evidence. Instead, it all came to him in a vision in 1894. Then, in 1912, he published a book promoting the theory. It didn't pick up a lot of steam until after World War I, but that was when Hitler and the other Nazis began supporting the idea themselves. One of the most important aspects of the world ice theory for Hitler involved icy moons. Hitler and the other believers were convinced that icy moons had crashed into the planet in the past, causing devastating floods. But these moons from outer space also brought tiny pieces of extraterrestrial DNA, and it was Hitler's belief that these living kernels of space DNA slowly evolved into Aryan superbeings. Heinrich Himmler believed the ancient superbeings had paranormal powers, and only by getting back to their roots could the German Aryans develop such divine abilities once more. Many of the top players in the Nazi government shared these wacky ideas, and it was one of the big reasons that Hitler turned out to be such a terrible leader. Most of his decisions were made based on faith, occult beliefs, and the paranormal. In the 1930s, Rudolf Hess attempted to create the Central Institute for Occultism. It was to be a group of psychics, mediums, and occultists, and the Nazis were hoping to put the various powers of these special individuals together to help fight the war against the West. After Benito Mussolini was imprisoned in 1943, 
The SS gathered three dozen occultists. The occultists were supposed to use their combined mental energy to track down the deposed dictator, but unfortunately for them, it didn't work. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Train full of gold. In August 2015, Peter Koper and Andrzej Richter, a Polish and German treasure hunting duo, announced the discovery of a long lost Nazi train laden with gold that went missing in early 1945. Legend holds that the Nazis hid the nearly 500 foot long armored train in a sealed hillside tunnel in the then East German city of Breslau, which is now the Polish city of Walbrich. They loaded it up with 300 tons of gold, diamonds, other precious gems, and firearms that were stolen from the Soviet Union, the story claims. In what Koper and Richter referred to as irrefutable evidence, the pair produced radar images of what they believed to be the lost train. Experts were quick to question the find as a potential hoax, while Polish authorities reportedly said that they were 99% certain the train exists. The treasure hunters have not actually been able to dig for the train, but they continue to perform non-invasive detailed tests of the site in hopes of producing a more detailed image of what's buried there. Local folklore continues to tell the story of this missing train, and if they are able to get to it, it might just be one of the biggest missing treasures ever found. Rommel's Gold during the German occupation of Tunisia in 1943, the Nazis allegedly stole a large amount of gold from Jews living on the island of Jerba. The looted gold, rumored to be worth around $50 million, was first shipped to the Mediterranean island of Corsica, which sits between the French and Italian coasts. Then, while en route to Germany, the ship carrying the gold allegedly sank, perhaps on purpose to keep it out of Allied hands, or maybe the ship was bombed. Known as Rommel's Gold, the treasure is named after a Nazi general named Erwin Rommel, who historians believe wasn't involved in this particular theft, but who embarked on a campaign of terror throughout North Africa during his wartime career. The legend inspired a fictional storyline about two divers dying while searching for Rommel's Gold in Ian Fleming's 1963 James Bond novel on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Fleming himself actually attempted to find the gold, but he was unsuccessful. Rommel's Gold also motivated real-life treasure hunters to look for the lost hoard, and nobody has found it so far, despite the 2007 claims of treasure hunter Terry Hodgkinson that he had pinpointed the treasure's location. The belief is that it is still somewhere off the coast of Corsica. Portrait of a Young Man One of the most famous and historically significant paintings among the many the Nazis stole during World War II is revered Italian Renaissance artist Raffaello Sanzio's Portrait of a Young Man. Raphael's portrait was hanging on a museum wall in Poland until 1939, when German troops crossed the border into Poland. Prince Agustin Joseph heroically grabbed the painting and several other important artworks to hide them away, but they were discovered and fell into the hands of Hitler's lawyer, Hans Frank. He was appointed the governor of the general government of Poland, and he decorated his home with the artwork. They were then sent to Linz, where they were supposed to become part of Hitler's private collection, but in 1945, Frank took the paintings back and put them in Wawel Castle, his home in Krakow. When American troops arrested Frank for war crimes, portrait of a young man and 843 other artifacts were missing from Wawel Castle. The painting was never seen again. If it were rediscovered, it would have an estimated value of at least $100 million. Buried Gold 75 years ago, an SS officer using the pseudonym Michaelis compiled a journal detailing 11 sites that allegedly contain gold stolen and hidden by the Nazis, totaling over 30 tons of treasure. The diary delves into Nazi commander Heinrich Himmler's end of World War II plans to conceal European artifacts, riches, religious items, and pieces of artwork from Germany, Poland, France, Belgium, and Russia. The Michaelis diary remained a secret for decades following the war, hidden at a Masonic lodge in Quedlin Germany. During the Third Reich, the secret society, which has existed for over 1,000 years, counted numerous Nazi officers among its membership. The diary's existence finally became widely known last year, when the secret society in Germany in possession of the book gifted it to a foundation in Poland called Silesian Bridge as an apology for the atrocities of World War II. One of the locations mentioned in the journal is in the village of Rostoka in southwestern Poland, at the bottom of a nearly 200-foot deep well beneath the 16th-century Hochberg Palace. 
This stash alone is thought to contain around 31 tons of gold, potentially worth billions of dollars. Researchers believe it may have come from the Reichsbank that once stood in the town. Permission was granted to search the well as the palace's current owner restores the property, and Poland's Ministry of Culture has announced its plans to wait until the diary's details are confirmed to investigate any other alleged buried treasure sites. Munich Stash The Nazis committed history's biggest art theft, stealing around 650,000 paintings and other works throughout Europe. Many of these artifacts have never been recovered, and every now and then a long missing piece or a concealed hoard comes to light. In November 2013, news broke that German authorities recovered 1,285 such stolen pieces of artwork, worth over a billion dollars, from a Munich apartment. The situation first began to unfold when border-crossing agents interviewed and searched an elderly, white-haired man named Rolf Nikolaus Cornelius Gerlitt at the Lindau border between Zurich and Munich. Based on Gerlitt's nervous behavior and an envelope he had containing 9,000 euros, officers flagged him for further investigation. Gerlitt was strangely obscure, as investigators soon discovered, with no record of being a taxpayer, receiving a pension, having health insurance, or even having any bank accounts. Yet he had lived in a luxury apartment for the last half century, and he bears the same last name as Hildebrand Garlet, a museum curator and Nazi-approved art dealer who helped collectors amass valuable artwork during the Third Reich, despite his one-quarter Jewish heritage. When police executed a search warrant on Gerlitz's apartment in 2012, they discovered a treasure trove of over 1,285 artworks, including pieces by Renoir, Matisse, Picasso, Max Lieberman, Otto Dix, and more. As it turned out, the man's father was none other than Hildebrand Gerlitt, and Cornelius was essentially his successor in the stolen art business. Due to Germany's ambiguous laws regarding looted artwork, including the fact that owning stolen paintings is not a criminal offense in and of itself, Gerlitt was never criminally charged. He passed away in May 2014, shortly after the scandal broke. Have you ever seen Raiders of the Lost Art? If not, it's a great show, and the first episode was all about this called Hitler's Art Dealer. I love that show. Portrait of Trude Steiner Much of the artwork lost under Nazi control during World War II included paintings that were sold by Jewish people seeking funds to escape, as well as pieces that the Nazis confiscated based on their own convoluted reasons. The portrait of Trude Steiner, the ghostly posthumous portrait of a 13-year-old girl painted by Gustav Klimt in 1898, before the artist's career reached its heyday, is one such stolen artwork. Trude's mother, Jenny Steiner, fled Vienna in 1938, shortly after Nazis seized control of the city on March 12th, according to Fadon. It's believed that the painting was seized for tax payments, although whether taxes were owed remains heavily doubted. In April 1941, the portrait of Trude Steiner was sold at auction, and that was the last time it was ever seen. Merker's Mine As World War II drew to a close, the Nazis scrambled to hide hundreds of tons of gold worth billions of dollars and other treasures they had looted from throughout Europe. Little did the Germans know, the Allies were closing in on them in a mission called Operation Safe Haven, which sought to recover the copious amounts of stolen valuables. On April 6, 1945, U.S. Army troops traveling on foot through the town of Merkers, Germany, about 200 miles south of Berlin, encountered two French women who were displaced persons taken from their homes and transported to their current location, where they became forced laborers. The ladies informed the soldiers about a nearby abandoned salt mine containing a vast amount of gold that the Germans brought in by the truckload. Generals Eisenhower and Patton traveled to the site and acting on the tip, they discovered the massive hoard in an underground pit. The subterranean stash, measuring 75 feet deep and 150 feet wide, contained roughly 7,000 sacks of gold bullion, as well as 98 million French francs, and art masterpieces piled high, while much of the treasure was looted from the central banks and museums of German-occupied country. There was also luggage filled with gold tooth fillings, wedding rings, and other effects belonging to victims who were forced into concentration camps. The gold was divided among France, Britain, and the U.S. Today, much of the American stash remains stored at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York City, although Holocaust survivors and their descendants have long sought to recover some of what was taken from its rightful owners. Pizarro Painting A Jewish couple named Fritz and Lily Kaysier had little choice other than to hand over an 1897 Impressionist oil painting by Camille Pizarro, titled Rue Saint-Honoré, Après-midi à fait de pluie, to the Germans. They were supposed to receive around $360 for the piece, 
which depicts a rainy Parisian street. But the money went into a blocked account that the couple was never able to access, and Lily passed away in 1962 after searching for years for the painting to no avail. A friend of Lily's grandson, Claude Casserere, rediscovered the artwork in 1999 in a museum in Madrid. Surviving family members spent decades trying to retrieve the painting, now worth tens of millions of dollars, only for their pursuits to turn out fruitless, according to NPR. To the family's disappointment, in May 2019, a federal judge in Los Angeles ruled that the painting had passed through too many owners over the years to prove that its current owner, the thyssen bornemitsa collection, knew that it was stolen or to have any reason to suspect that it was. While ownership of the painting would have likely been granted to the family under California law, the court was required to apply Spanish law to the artwork, leaving the family empty-handed. The ruling came despite the 2009 assertion of Spain and several other countries that artwork stolen by the Nazis should be returned to the victims or their surviving relatives. Despite this, the country fought to maintain possession of the painting, claiming it has rightful ownership. Rothschild Family Treasures During the annexation of Austria to Nazi Germany in 1938, the Nazis confiscated some 3,500 art objects from Alphonse and Clarice de Rothschild of Vienna. The collection, which represented one of the greatest of the time, was relocated to a salt mine west of Vienna, where it was well cared for due to its value, according to the Boston University publication BU Today. The Rothschilds searched tirelessly for their treasure following the war, with some luck recovering several dozen items by the late 1940s. As a price for exporting the collection, the Austrian government collected 250 of the recovered items, eventually returning them to the Rothschilds during the 1990s. The family's heirs donated 186 items to the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, many of which came from the 250 seized by the Austrian government and eventually given back to the Rothschilds. Included among them are a 1920s-era platinum and diamond necklace and tiara combo, an Art Deco brooch containing diamonds, platinum and emeralds, a pearl and diamond necklace dating back to the late 19th century, and nearly 400-year-old jeweled and highly decorated boxes. The collection of 250 returned items also contains 31 paintings, antique musical instruments and weapons, carpets, navigation instruments, and globes. Austria's decision marked the country's decision to reshape its image and provide due restitution to victims and their survivors in consideration of its ambiguous role in the war. The Amber Room The Amber Room was built during the early 18th century by Friedrich I, the first king of Prussia. It contained floor-to-ceiling wall panels adorned with fossilized amber, semi-precious stones, and gold leaf, which were worth an estimated $142 million in today's money. In 1716, following a visit from Peter the Great of Russia, who admired the Gilded Room, Friedrich I gifted its contents to the emperor to cement the Prussian-Russian alliance against Sweden. The Amber Room was installed at the Winter House in St. Petersburg before being relocated in 1755 to the Catherine Palace in Pushkin per the orders of Tsarina Elizabeth. The Nazis invaded the Soviet Union in 1941 in what was called Operation Barbarossa, during which they looted the Amber Room's contents, justifying the seizure based on their belief that Germans created it. In anticipation of the Germans' arrival, Soviet officials had tried relocating the Amber Room, but the delicate amber began crumbling, so instead they attempted to conceal the room with thin wallpaper. German soldiers did not fall for the ruse. They packed the room's contents into crates and shipped them to a castle museum in Konigsberg, Germany. The room was dismantled, crated, and shipped away again in 1943 as Allied forces descended upon the city. Where the Amber Room went next is a mystery, as most of its contents were never seen again. Perhaps the materials were destroyed during one of the many bombing raids that pummel Germany, as some experts have suggested, or maybe the Amber Room remains in storage in a well-hidden or obscure place to this day. Just one piece of the Amber Room has been found so far, and it did not lead to the discovery of more artifacts. In 1997, someone told art detectives that a seller was trying to sell a piece of the Amber Room. Upon raiding the seller's lawyer's office, the detectives learned that the owner of the panel was unaware of its origins. If the rest of the original Amber Room is out there, either nobody knows where it is or nobody's saying anything about what they do know. Thanks for watching! There are many more missing treasures out there, just not enough time. If you enjoyed today's video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe if you haven't already. See you soon! Bye!